How do folks? It's the afternoon of the Friday the 13th of May. What could possibly go wrong today I wonder? Yep, of all the areas that I've walked in the past 12 months, there's one area that I've neglected. And that's my local area, my local patch in South Pennines. So, we're doing a lot of gallivanting about lately, driving up to dales and lakes. I thought I'd save on the petrol and uh, do somewhat local. I have actually driven to the start of the journey, it's only, uh, I don't know, two or three miles. And I've parked up in Denshaw in Saddleworth. Um, and I'm heading uh, roughly east out of the valley towards the Pennine Way for now. And I'm going to wild camp in a place where I've wild camped before. I'm just taking a rest, I'm trying to get out of this, this nagging, gnawing wind and it's swirling about but I can't, I can't avoid it. So I'm down in the rocks here on Milston Edge, uh, just above the Castle Shore Valley, which you can see just down there, the reservoirs. Uh, if you look south, you look into the highest point of Milston Edge and the, the Pennine Way sort of comes just, just above these rocks at the back of me and I'm going to follow that northwards. Trying to get a bit of shelter from this wind. Oh, caterpillar! I don't know what it is. Fast. The speed of it. The first Wainwright guide I got when I was about 15 was Wainwright's Pennine Way Companion. And I like reading about this area, my local area, my local stretch of the Pennine Way. And one thing that was of high interest to me as a typically ghoulish teenager was a reference he made to an unsolved double murder on this moor in 1903. So on the 9th of September, 1903, a fella called Robert Kenyon was sat with his father, who was, uh, his father was the gamekeeper, just over that way on the Saddleworth side of the moor. And the Saddle Saddleworth side of the moor is a free moor, or was. In them days, if you had a gun license, you could shoot it. This side, right, on Marsden Moor, was a private moor. And these two fellas were watching the private moor. And apparently it was a day of like drifting mist, drizzle, moor grime. And they witnessed a fella cross from the free moor to the private moor. And Bob Kenyon, he was called Robert Kenyon, set off after him. And unfortunately, that was the last time that Bob Kenyon was seen alive. His father waited up all night. They were living at Buckstone's house, which is just over the moor there, looked across this moor. Waited up all night for news of his son. Now the following morning, uh, when Bob Kenyon hadn't returned, a search party was sent out. Unfortunately, the day before, the night before, another gamekeeper had gone missing on this moor, a fella called William Utley, who lived on the Stanage side of the moor. Now when the search party come out, they found William Utley, and he'd been shot in the back and in the head. The search party continued looking for um, Bob Kenyon and he took some finding and attempts had been made to sort of conceal the body with him. It's partially covered up. So they had a job finding him, but they did. And he'd been shot in the neck. Now, because of the circumstances of how the bodies were found and the wounds, the obvious conclusion, it was probably correct, is that Bob Kenyon disturbed a poacher and he tried to wrestle the gun off him. The poacher had a gun. And in the ensuing struggle, 
Bob Kenyon got shot in the neck. As the poacher tried to leave the mower, he unfortunately came across another keeper, William Utley, who may have witnessed what had gone on. William Utley tried to flee and he was shot in the back and then in the head to silence him. It was like an execution. Uh, pretty, pretty gruesome, really. Now, that day, there was only one person, one other person known to be on the mower, and it was a fella from Oldham. And this fella was a popular fella in Oldham. He was a wrestler and a bit of a character, and he was well-liked, apparently. Now, he admitted he was on the mower, but he denied all involvement in the crimes. But he did say he witnessed two strangers on the mower, and these strangers were never traced. Uh, the police had no alternative after they spoke to this character from Oldham than to release him. All the evidence was circumstantial, so th there was just no choice. They had to let him go. And after that, no other evidence, no other people, no other suspects came to light. And, and thus, as a result to this day, those two murders of Robert Kenyon and William Utley remain unsolved. Till now, and astonishingly, I've seen another camper blow on Pennine Way. You don't see many, many other campers up here. Yeah, my place for tonight is that moor just on the skyline at the back of me. I'm going up to Western Edge, where I've camped before. Sent up, it's very windy. I've got my summer bag today, my Criterion Ultralight. Right, I'm nicely ensconced in the tent now. I've not been able to pitch on Western Edge because I'm in the scarp and it's got a bigger footprint than the notch, which I used the last time I got up here. And I just couldn't get this in the right sort of area I wanted. And it's also very exposed on the edge. This, this wind's just not let up. Um, but I've had, uh, I've had a few snacks, I've had a brew, and uh, I'm quite settled now. It's nice to be in the tent out of this wind. Where we're situated on these moors here, we're right in the heart of a, of a Mesolithic landscape. Over the years, the amount of finds that have been found on this moor, mainly, mainly in flint, flint tools, has been, been colossal. It's, it's a real hot spot for, for Mesolithic activity, this. And in the 1990s, when I started collecting Amon Wrigley's books, he in his uh, younger days, he used to go flinting, he used to go wandering all over the moors looking for flints. And as soon as I discovered you could find flints on these moors, Stone Age, Stone Age artefacts, I set about trying to find my own with gusto. So what I've done, I've brought a series of flints with me. Two of them are legit, proper, true, old Stone Age tools that I've found on the moors around here. Two of them are replicas. Starting with the oldest, 
this one is about 8000 BC and it's a small flint called a microlith which is classic sort of mesolithic technology and this would have been embedded in a projectile point with a series of other small flints moving into the neolithic we start seeing single arrowheads like this one this is a replica uh, a replica one found not far from here on Windale. Um and you can see yeah this this is a single arrowhead that would have been embedded into a wooden shaft about 4000 bc this sort of technology now this next one is the best flint i've ever found on the moors it's a later neolithic arrowhead and as you can see i'm holding it by a barb so a barb's appeared now um, and i found this on crompton moor not too far from here mm, mid to late 1990s i'd say chuffed to bits with this absolutely thrilled when i found this my best find so if that had one barb going into the bronze age which is about 2000 bc they were still using flint even in the bronze age this is what is called a barbed and tanged arrowhead um, this is a replica a very well made replica but ones as good as this have been found on the moors around here i knew a bloke who found an absolute cracker on pure hill just just south of here uh, but a lot of the ones that have been found around here are a little bit more rustic compared to this one um, but it is it's, it's a beautiful replica it's nice that people can still make them today It's just turned 25 to 9 now, the sun's sinking, but there's like a thin layer of milky cloud on the horizon, so I don't think we're going to get anything too dramatic on that score. The wind has dropped a little bit, finally. It said it would during the night. Still a bit gusty, but it's a little bit better, not quite as so we're irritating. Uh, I've got a can of lag with me, so I think I'm going to have a, a mosey over to the waste zone. I'm going to suck that over there, gazing northwards. It's quarter to twelve and I think uh, it's about my bedtime. I've been reading for a bit, drinking, eating, um, but no, I'm feeling a bit tired now. Sunrise is about ten past five tomorrow morning, but if I'm awake I'll get up for it, but I'm, I'm not making a special effort to do so. I fancy a bit of a, a bit of a camping lying. Camping line, what's that? 6 a.m., whatever, I don't know. Um, but I'm up early Sunday morning, so it's my only chance of a bit of a lie in this, this weekend. So I'll see what happens anyway. I'm, I'm just leaving it to chance. Uh, anyway, good night, and I shall see you in the morning. Good morning. I've had a lie in today. It's 10 past 6. 10 past 6, a lie in. That's the time I get up for work. Um, yeah, I've had a pleasant enough night really, I slept, slept pretty good, um, woke up a couple of times but managed to drop off quite quickly. That wind got up again during the night, but it seems to have uh, dropped quite a bit now, but it didn't, it didn't disturb me too much. So I'm going to get a brew on, um, probably have a little bit of something to eat, then I'll, uh, I'll start tackling down. Right folks, all packed up, ready to go. There's my spot, no trace left. Always important. I've got now about, I don't know, 
four miles back to Denshaw. Won't take me too long, downhill all the way, lighter pack. I'll speak to you before I get back to the car. I'm following a path just above Dowry Res. I've probably got about a mile back to Densha now. Uh, so it's been a nice, nice relaxing morning for me. Not my usual rush. I tend to rush a bit in the mornings. But very enjoyable camp that. Nice to stay local. I hope I haven't waffled too much. Lots of, lots of interest there for me. And I'm not always sure <laughs> if it's of interest to anybody else. Uh, so thanks for watching. Look after yourselves. And I'll see you next time.